Hi, everybody. I'm Dick Clay, the president of the Filson Historical Society. Thank you for joining us both in person and virtually for this wonderful 27th annual Filson Historical Society house tour. This event would not be possible without the tireless work of our committee and our sponsors. We would like to thank the House Committee and Anita Streeter for leading the House Tour Committee. The Filson would like to extend a special thanks to John David Miles for his extensive work on the House Tour research notes and his presentation. We would also like to take this time to acknowledge our sponsors for this event. The lead sponsor is Bluegrass Motorsport. The other sponsors are Kentucky Select Properties, Mountjoy Chilton and Medley, Ben Tyler Building and Remodeling, Advance Ready Mix, Cars and Langen James Construction, Parthenon LLC, Antiques at Distillery Commons, the Glenview Trust Company, and Alcott and Bentley Lighting and Design. Our speaker is John David Miles. He is an attorney, a former circuit court judge, and a preservationist. He has written and lectured on architecture for the Filson Historical Society for a quarter century. And he has prepared historical and architectural reports on Southern hunting plantations for Plantation Services, Inc. in Charleston, South Carolina. Both his 2016 Historic Architecture of Shelby County, Kentucky, 1792 through 1915, and his 2019 Walter H. Kaiser's Neighborhood Sketches Revisited, received the Samuel B. Thomas Book Award from the Louisville Historical League and publication awards from the Kentucky Historical Society. In between, he was commissioned by the owners of the Beaumont Inn in Harrodsburg, Kentucky, to write a history of the inn in celebration of the family's 100th anniversary of ownership. His latest book, The Tuileries, a history of a Northern Virginia plantation, has now uh, come back from the printer. He has consulted on numerous restoration projects and was selected to attend the Addingham Trust Summer School in 2019. Miles and his wife, Mary Helen, received awards from the Ida Lee Willis Memorial Foundation in Preservation, Kentucky, for the restoration of the 1839 John Dale House in Simpsonville, Kentucky, where they have lived since 2004. And so now I'm very happy to welcome John David Miles to the Filson for this fascinating lecture that you're about to hear. Thank you. The result of the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. Uh, there were a number of the most famous architects in the country, several of whom were trained at the Ecole, who were involved in the planning and layout of that exposition, along with Frederick Law Olmsted of local park fame. Uh, the buildings were all temporary, which was typical of expositions, or world's fairs as we call them. Uh, and these were all painted white, and they became known as the White City. Uh, the effect on the nation was immense, and it set a style of architecture which became the predominant style in the country for well over a quarter century. Uh, St. Gaudens quipped after a meeting of the planning committee, do you realize this is the greatest meeting of artists since the 15th century? Louis Sullivan, on the other hand, was less pleased. He later commented that the damage wrought by the World's Fair will last for half a century, if not longer. Love it or loathe it, there's no doubt that in the words of Robert A. M. Stern, it revolutionized the course of contemporary architecture in America. The dawn of the 20th century, the Beaux-Arts was at its zenith, 
and the fortunes of Edward Hyde Ferguson were also at their zenith. He was born in 1852, the son of a wealthy tobacco merchant and grew up in Louisville. Uh, we don't know where he was educated, but he began his career as a banker. Uh, that didn't last too long. And in 1881, he founded something called the Ar Arctic Test Oil Refinery, which advertised its oil as, quote, the most valuable substitute for lard, close quote. That became the Kentucky Refining Company, which became the second largest refiner of cottonseed oil in the world. The company had a subsidiary called the Louisville Soap Company and owned a majority uh, percentage of nine other seed mills in the South. In 1898, Ferguson married Sophie Fullerton Marfield of Chillicothe, Ohio. She was 20 years his junior, and a year after their marriage, they were blessed with a daughter. And apparently that caused them to think about building a new house. Uh, to build that new house, they called on a, the firm of Dodd and Cobb. The firm was a relatively short-lived partnership between William J. Dodd and Arthur Cobb. It lasted from 1896 to 1904. Arthur Cobb was a Cleveland native and was trained as an engineer. And after leaving his partnership with Dodd, worked mainly on railroads and bridges for the rest of his career. Dodd is said to have been born in Canada and raised in Chicago, but the details and the dates of his early career are somewhat up in the air. There may have been a bit of resume padding involved in some of the reports. Uh, he is said to have attended the Chicago Art Institute and begun work in Chicago with William LeBaron Jenny, who was credited with building the first office building with a full, fully steel frame and therefore the first skyscraper. Uh, Dodd later worked on the company town of Pullman, named for the eponymous rail car producer. When he actually got to Louisville is subject to debate as well. Some sources say 1884, but other have him still involved at Pullman in 1886. An article published in the Courier in 1897 said that he was employed for two years in New York, <coughs> excuse me, with McKim, Mead and White. Uh, whenever he got here, he was briefly associated with an architect named Oscar Whale, W-E-H-L-E. -E. And I have no idea how one actually pronounces that. Uh, virtually nothing is known about Whale except that he was associated with Dodd and this building which stood on Walnut, Fifth and Wal near Fifth and Walnut is the only building that is attributed to Whale and his partner, earlier partner, Mergle. And we know about that only because the Jewish Free Press of St. Louis in March 1885 carried a column that had been sent in by someone from Louisville the Jewish community and reported, quote, the remodeling of the same has been entrusted to our rising young Jewish architect, Mr. Oscar Whale of the firm of Mergel and Whale, thus ensuring first class workmanship in every respect. Uh, this apparently was a remodel, but you will see various things that show up later. Uh, the exaggerated voussoirs over the windows, lots of pilasters, a heavy cornice. And then we have sort of a Gothic Moorish entryway thrown into the midst of it all. So who could figure? In 1887, uh, Dodd joined Mason Mowry and the firm became Mowry and Dodd. While together they completed numerous buildings in Louisville, but their best known is the Louisville Trust Building completed in 1891. Uh, in the Richardsonian Romanesque style, it was described by the courier as, quote, the finest structure of its kind south of the Ohio River. And everyone's local architect expert, Sam Thomas, agreed with that conclusion. Uh, perhaps the most interesting connection to McKim, Mead, and White uh, is the Kentucky building for the Columbian Exposition in the lower, on the lower left. Uh, it bears a striking resemblance to the HAC White Cottage built in Newport, Rhode Island between 1884 and 1886. And the White Cottage was designed by McKim, Mead and White. 
uh, particularly the use of the Palladian windows on either side of the entry, uh, the heavy cornice. And you'll note, this doesn't have anything to do with Kim Mead and White, but you'll note Daniel Boone by Eden Yandel standing right there at the corner. Uh, it's possible that Dodd was in fact working with McKim, Mead and White if his report in 1897 is correct. At the time the Newport house was designed. Uh, his experience with the Columbian Exposition and the classical architecture he saw there and executed there apparently led him away from the Romanesque and the Chateauesque, which were very prominent in Old Louisville. Uh, and this shift is apparent in the home that he designed for Samuel Grebfelder at 1442 Third Street, just down the street on the right. Uh, we don't know the connection between Dodd and the Fergusons, or how we, we assume that this house going up is probably what prompted the Fergusons to contact Dodd. You'll notice a lot of similarities between it and the Ferguson mansion. Again, these exaggerated ossoirs over an rusticated first story. This single bay porch, if you look up at the top, you'll see a wonderful carved plaque that fits within the entablature and its mate going across. Uh, and the houses are basically the same size. The front porch also bears a considerable uh, resemblance to the one here, a one-story porch supported by here composite columns. Uh, and you will note the very heavy cornice with the dental and the modillion uh, uh, topping the building, the, all classical elements that were combined. Going up just three blocks down the street, the Fergusons could not have missed it. In designing the Ferguson mansion, it appears that Dodd took the basic model of the Grabfelder house and crossed it with the Andrew Carnegie mansion in New York and added a dash of French hotel particulier to the mix. The Carnegie mansion, although larger, employs the same basic vocabulary. Like Grabfelder house, the first floor of both Carnegie and Ferguson houses have heavily rusticated stone bases, and the second and third floors are composed of brick with coined corners, and they are topped with balustrades and stone urns at the corners. Carnegie's architects were from New York, Bab, Cook, and Willard, and they were at work on, the, on this house at the time that the Ferguson house was being designed. Uh, a model, a picture of a model of this house appeared in the Tampa Tribune in Christmas of 1899, showing how interested people around the country were in whatever Andrew was doing with his money. Uh, while Ferguson took the, Ferguson and Dodd took the French approach, this is a very English Baroque execution with the, oops, um, square windows, the pediment here, the segmental arches. Uh, you'll notice that all the windows are single pane, double sash, and the only curves are in these first floor windows, but otherwise is a fairly straightforward building. Uh, Dodd took a much more ornate and arguably French approach here. Uh, the entry porch is rather staid, although well, I love the eclecticism involved. Here we have ionic columns, but we have a Doric entablature, but we've got all this going on. Uh, the biggest difference between the two houses is their width. And it appears that the Carnegie house, they tried to make it look as wide as humanly possible. This one, Dodd obviously tried to make it look as tall as possible. Uh, therefore, reducing the five bays on the first floor to three on the second and third. One of the most inter interesting things about this house is the fenestration, the windows. Uh, you can go through 
as many books as you want and you won't find a French Renaissance house with windows like this. Uh, it appears to have been primarily a New York phenomenon. Whoops, getting ahead of myself here. Uh, this house was built for Benjamin Duke and remained in the family for over a hundred years. You will see the same vertical connection of the windows, the coin corners with the brick inset, the very heavy cornice. And then you see here at the St. Regis Hotel in New York, these very ornate window frames within all the other ornate. And one of the first rules of architecture is that a curve costs about four times as much as a straight line. The ultimate of this approach is the New York Yacht Club with these fabulous windows that look like the stern of a ship uh, that line the first floor. But you can see in the midst of it all, we have our columns and the beautiful detailing all the way around. But it just boggles the mind to think of trying to get somebody to carve the dolphin spitting the water and have the ram's head in the middle of the fruit swags and the cartouche. I'm sorry. Uh, I get carried away with that one. At any rate, that's sort of what we've got going on here. Uh, if you look at the windows at the Ferguson closely, which they really merit, you'll see again, even, even a carved right there in the window frame, but we have these beautifully detailed consoles, uh, fruit and flowers, guiloche. Upstairs, we have even more with the cartouche. It's just incredible. And when you put it all together, it goes right straight on up to this cornice, which has, again, dental molding, egg and dart, modillions. They spared no expense and threw every element at it they could and came up with a magnificent composition in the process. Carnegie is quoted as telling Babb that he wanted, quote, the most modest, plainest, and roomiest house in New York, close quote. A uh, few today would consider Carnegie's house as plain or modest, and nobody in Louisville considered the Ferguson house to be either. Uh, it was said in the papers to be Louisville's most expensive house. Uh, the lush detailing of the exterior is matched in the interior, which is highly eclectic. Uh, the vestibule has this beautiful, these beautiful glass mosaic panels, which have inset electric lights. And then when you get to the grand hall, you have this elegant coffered ceiling. <clears throat> uh, the oak paneling and the coffered ceiling, I mean, it's a baronial room, which bears absolutely no resemblance to the exterior of the house. Uh, the wall to the right as you enter now was originally this staircase. And as you see, it went up the steps split under the window above the outside entrance and then back upstairs. I would give my eye teeth to know where these four strap work columns ended up. Uh, they are absolutely knockout. And they hold up a, a similar hall on the second floor. Uh, adding to the mix, the staircase has, again, these newels with the Jacobean strap work, and then these wonderful little columns with the ionic capital. And then there's this fireplace. We've got these two poor little columns trying to hold up all of this. And you think, I hope it doesn't fall on my head. Uh, but look at the level of detail. Everything is yet, you just can't imagine getting that done. The primary res room of the residence is the library, which is to the left of the entry and features built-in bookcases, which are separated by pilasters with gilded or Corinthian capitals. Uh, you should note the beautiful plaster work on the ceiling. And my photo doesn't show any of the bookcases, but the corners of the bookcases have columns, which again have the strap work that reflects the entry hall. 
and I said that the building is eclectic and possibly nothing exemplifies that greater than the mantle in the parlor or the library. Uh, it includes this bronze frieze by sculptress Julia Bracken Went, who lived from 1871 to 1942. She was a native of Illinois and later, like many others in this story, moved to California. She worked primarily in bronze and she created a sculpture called Illinois Welcome the Nations, which was featured at the Illinois Pavilion at the 1893 exposition. So a good guess might be that Dodd became familiar with her work at that time and therefore called upon her to produce this piece. The inscription runs along the bottom. Uh, and we have the mother and child, husband and dog, and then we have an angel with a lyre. And in the midst of this egg and dart molding, which runs all the way around the room, we've got these beautiful Art Nouveau trees separating things. Just a little of everything everywhere you look. The dining room is closely akin to the hall. And, but the panel st paneling stopped short of the ceiling, leaving room for a mural featuring scenes that are said to be from Carl Maria von Weber's Der Freischutz. Now, I can't possibly give a better description of that than is in the guide for the Filson. Quote, the title translates as a, the free shooter or marksman, referring to the fact that the hero casts six bullets guaranteed to find their mark and a seventh that belongs to the devil. He does this to ensure that he will win a shooting contest and thus the hand of his love, the daughter of the head forester. Of course, everything goes wrong and he ends up shooting her. This is the line I most like. It seems like a grim story to illustrate in your dining room. Uh, it circles the room and as you can see, uh, is very much in the romantic forest type, for lack of a better word. Uh, the thing that I'm most fascinated with is this fireplace in the dining room. Again, you've got a little bit of everything. You've got these beautifully detailed columns. What are they sitting on? Where did that come from? But the real star is this magnificent inlaid glass surround, which was created by Orlando Giannini, who was a Cincinnatian who lived from 1860 to 1928. In Cincinnati, he started out working in stone yards, ended up working in a foundry, moved to Chicago, painted murals for Frank Lloyd Wright, founded a glass company in 1899, and he too later moved to California. This is the reception room, and it's the only room on the first floor that bears any relationship to the exterior of the house. On the other hand, possibly because of the boldness of the exterior or the boldness of the other more Jacobean rooms, it's sort of weak. Uh, it's a take on French boiseries, but the thing that's most remarkable about it is if you start looking, there are three different patterns of inlay that run around all of the woodwork in that room. And I don't know whether they bought it by the yard, whether they had somebody make it or not, but it's incredible. It runs all of these, it runs along the chair rail, it runs up and down along the window, it's everywhere, uh, remarkable. Uh, the second floor of the house, like the first, originally focused on the grand stairway and led to a central hall off of which the chambers or bedrooms opened. A separate hall ran to the third floor, and con which contained additional bedrooms, a nursery, and a trunk room. Uh, the service rooms were in the rear of the house, and it's fascinating to look at the plan of the, the elevation of the front of the house with its complete symmetry and watch it fade away to you get to the back of the house where they put whatever they needed wherever they wanted. Uh, in this picture, you will see openings which have been cut into the chambers 
uh, which now serve as research rooms. And also you will see a repeat of that baluster from the stairway, again with the diminishing, almost like an upside down obelisk with the ionic capital. And you can only describe the house as schizophrenic. Uh, this is one side of the door to the Northeast Chamber, which now serves as Professor Clay's office. And this is the back side of it. And this gorgeous doorknob is similar to those throughout the house. But can you think of a more amazing contrast from one spot to the next, just going through a door? Uh, you enter this room, which is a lovely room and you'll see that they decorated everything. There's swags in this plaster cornice and they're repeated in this mantle. And my, I love the portrait of Judge Martin. Each of the bed, each of the chambers had its own decorative scheme. Uh, one suspects that that was Mrs. Ferguson's and the one for Mr. Ferguson was considerably more austere. Uh, there are all sorts of fascinating things floating around. Uh, somebody we know didn't like the, graph, the dragonfly light fixture from Tiffany, so he moved his, he got a bigger office, uh, but it's a magnificent fixture. <clears throat> and it took me a long, I stared and stared and actually wrote, is it really a grasshopper? But, and then it dawned on you, these are the tails of the two dragonflies and their wings, and you can see their antenna. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, the house was big, therefore it required big furniture. This sofa is in the entry now, and I suspect it was made for the house because it has the same strap work element at the bottom uh, that is in the library bookcases. This thing, all I can say is excess was only the starting point. Uh, and again, we've got all these columns going on and this drone across the bottom. And then we've got, you know, their fry shirts blew up. Uh, the family moved into the house in 1904 and unfortunately did not get to stay very long. Uh, but while things were good, Mr. Ferguson kept on building. This was, is the only surviving building of the Kentucky Refining Company, which is at Shelby and Goss in Shelby Park, uh, designed by Fred Earhart. And again, it bears a great resemblance to the house with the stone rusticated base, the uh, accented voussoirs, the brick, again, a narrow gauge brick like the Ferguson coin corners. Now this, this corners is not quite gonna, it's not gonna live up to anything that Dodd did, but a uh, fascinating building and it remains intact and is now home, one of the branches of the Sojourner Church. Uh, things apparently went downhill pretty quickly, not long thereafter. Uh, the first indication of trouble was an article in the Courier in February of 1909, which was headlined reorganization. And it detailed the most convoluted plan you can imagine uh, about ending the financial problems of the company. Uh, part of that may be the fact that one of the people who was leading this was James Brown, who ultimately led the Bank of Kentucky disaster of which many of you all are familiar. Um, in April of that year, it was announced that the Marfield Milling Company in Chillicothe was also being closed, that being a business that Ferguson had inherited or had acquired via his wife. Uh, I think the thing finally came to an end in 1913 when Fort Georgia Banks sued for a appointment of a receiver and alleged mismanagement and speculation. Mm. By that time, uh, Ferguson was no longer involved with the company. The Fergusons managed to hold on to the house until 1924 when it was purchased by the Pearson family for their mortuary business, 
which would explain the elevator in the old building. If you've ever gone in, you think this is the strangest shape I've ever seen in an elevator until you realize it's just the right size for a coffin with somebody pushing and pulling. Um, and they remained here until the early 80s when Frank Metz became owner and then subsequently the Filson in 86. Um, I don't know whether he was in declining health or whether the, that caused the move or whether the finances caused the move and he died of a broken heart. But uh, in May of 1924, the Lexington Herald ran a headline, the oil king dies. And Mr. Ferguson went on to a great mansion in the sky. Uh, Mrs. Ferguson continued to live down the street until her death in 1951. Sadly, their only daughter, Margaret, died in 1929. While things weren't going so well for the Fergusons, Dodd was doing great guns in his Gothic period. Uh, he and Cobb are responsible for the old Presbyterian Seminary, which is, continues to be thought of as one of the greatest buildings in town. And they did the Fourth Avenue Methodist Church in 1901, which is also a lovely, lovely building. <clears throat> in 1906, Dodd joined up with Kenneth McDonald and the firm became McDonald and Dodd. Uh, I cannot swear, but I believe that Kenneth is the, the McDonald. There were four brothers, but I believe Kenneth is the one who partnered for a while with Mr. Sheblesi, and McDonald and Sheblesi were the architects of Undulata out in Shelby County, and we are very fortunate to have the owners of that farm with us tonight. We hope they become members. Uh, McDonald and Dodd had quite a run. They, their first commission was a major commission was apparently the Stewart's Dry Goods Store. And then we had the downtown YMCA, the Louisville Country Club, the Western Branch Library, and Lincliffe, which is another of the best houses in town. You can see that they are becoming much more restrained in their ornamentation. They're still using for public buildings this wonderful heavy cornice and here, but uh, the frou-frou, for lack of a better word, that exemplifies the front of this building is beginning to peel away and it's a starker classicism is arriving. Uh, others were designing great Beaux-Arts buildings in Louisville at this time. And some say the Louisville Free Public is the best Beaux-Arts building in town. Uh, I'm not sure I agree or disagree. It's a fabulous building that merits a lot more attention than it gets. Uh, it was designed by the firm of Pilcher and Tackall from New York in 1905. Uh, and Mr. Tackall was a Louisville native who had studied at the Ecole. Uh, the building, of course, excuse me, centers on this projecting bay with the portico and then the wings extend in a more plain fashion. But it, this building merits close attention. <clears throat> the, these panels appear between the windows above the water table running all the way around the front and back of the building uh, with the floor de lee. These little guys live in the Freeze. There are two of them. There's one, two more over here, uh, frolicking above. And my favorite is this guy, of whom there are four. The in cor corners of this building are chamfered or cut off at an angle, and there were originally fountains on each corner. And this was the fountain head. You can see where the water would have come out. Uh, again, a level of detailing and workmanship that we can only dream of today. Uh, the library, of course, was a public building, but the increasing classicism also was prevailing in domestic architecture. This is, of course, Rostrevor, which I believe is the finest house in town, bar none. Uh, designed by Carrara and Hastings in 1910. 
Uh, they are most famous for the New York Public Library, which is, of course, most famous for the pair of lines out front. Uh, this is a remarkable house. Uh, we have this Palladian motif, but it is accomplished by these engaged on it columns, and then the arch goes fully into the second floor of the house. Uh, not visible in this picture, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to get any pictures of this myself, but the symmetry of the facade is broken by a window here, which lights the stairway, which is sitting half and half. Uh, one of the things that the Beaux-Arts architects did, they took the training that they had in all of the classical details, and then they sometimes just had fun. Nowhere in Italy or anywhere else would a period building have had the rusticated stone on the second floor above a smooth surface. This would have been down here. So they're having fun. Uh, and then these, this is quite an incredible cornice. And then these lovely little windows that I think light baths. Light baths. Uh, this room is a billiard room. And this is the loggia that used to look out on the tall manship armillary sphere that's at the speed. Uh, and the hallway runs all the way across. And there's the hallway with these, and the stair comes down behind these columns. These gorgeous doorways that open into the dining room, the morning room, and the drawing room. Here, the drawing room with a lovely English inlaid marble mantle. The house is extremely symmetrical on the rear. These, the three rooms across the back are on fillade, and they all open onto a terrace, which used to look over the park. Um, it truly is a magnificent house, and those of you who are long-term uh, tour takers have been able to go see it twice, once when the malls were there, and then again in 2012 when after Ms. Fraser purchased it. it it's a, truly a spectacular house and a great exemplar of the those arts. Uh, Dodd and Cobb's best, excuse me, McDonald and Dodd's most significant, ultimately, contribution to the Beaux-Arts was the old First Christian Church on 4th Street. This is a postcard of the building shortly after it was completed, uh, designed in 1910. Uh, a lady, Marty Hedgepath, who I believe was associated with the Landmarks Commission, uh, did a wonderful master's thesis that's available online, from the Filson, actually. Uh, which tracked all the McDonald's and all the brothers, et cetera. And she describes this as the largest and finest Beaux-Arts church in Louisville. Uh, it was built to replace a magnificent Greek revival building that stood where the Starks building now is. These are the plans, which are in the collection of the Filson, or part of the plans, uh, which leads me to say anybody who's got good architecture plans tucked away in the attic where the mice are nibbling on the ends and the paper's getting crackly, we want them. Uh, you'll see here the, fa the facade and then the detail for these windows in the drum. Uh, I believe that this is another situation where McKim, Mead and White come into play. Uh, at this time, they had completed two very famous buildings in New York, one the Madison Square Presbyterian Church, and the other the library at the New York University. Uh, both of them used a Greek cross plan with a dome over the center and were fronted with hexastyle porticos. Uh, the drum, however, is Dodd's own. It's octagonal rather than round and has these beautifully detailed quatrefoil windows, eight of them to light the interior of the sanctuary. Uh, pay attention to this doorway on the next slide. Again, you see the layering of detail. That's the facade. And you'll see even here, 
this central door is distinguished from the lesser doors. Uh, it is tradition holds that these columns actually came from the building at Fourth and Walnut, but I don't know whether that's a fact or not. It's truly a, a marvelous building and it remains in remarkably good condition. Uh, probably the boldest Beaux-Arts building ever built in town is this building that nobody pays any attention to but me. It's the City Hall Annex and it sits between the Second Empire City Hall, which has got bulls and cows and sheep and anything and everything you might want spouting out of it. And then the sinking fund building, which was built as the firehouse next door. Uh, and you couldn't come up with a building any more different from those two if you tried. And even if you tried, I'm not sure you could find something that successfully melded the two. So a gentleman named Cornelius Curtin decided to hell with it all and did what he wanted to do. And he did it with great style. Uh, there are four, four Corinthian columns, then two more at each corner, acting like bookends. You're not going to confuse my building with what's going on on either side. You're going to look square at it. Then it's topped with this massive entablature. And then we have an even more massive parapet over the top, sort of like the mantle in the entry hall. You wonder if it's going to fall down on top of you. But I think it's a magnificent building and it does not get the attention it deserves. Uh, Curtin, I don't know much about and I haven't been able to find out much, but he was the architect of the Columbia building, which was said to be Louisville's first skyscraper, which stood uh, at the corner of 4th and Main. In fact, there's one block of it left. It was built in 1890 and came down in 1966. However, he was apparently well thought of in the trade because he was invested, quote unquote, in the American Institute of Architects College of Fellows in 1889 when he was just 35. Uh, the building for which he's probably best known at this stage of the game is St. Bridget Church over at Hepburn and Baxter, which is a, again, a very bold design. Uh, you don't miss it and it's beautifully detailed. I particularly love the archways and the archways and the archways that run down the side. He also designed this building, which is at 27th and Chestnut Streets, which is currently empty and boarded up. I almost cried when I got there. Uh, I also almost got hit by the young lady hiding behind the umbrella who said, you taking a picture of me? And I said, no, ma'am, I'm taking a picture of the bill. You didn't have my permission to take a picture of me. And then I got the picture and I said, she's behind the umbrella. I didn't get it even if I wanted it. Uh, but that's just one of my little, there are so many architectural tragedies in the West End, but that is just a sin that that building is being allowed to uh, deteriorate the way it is. Uh, the Beaux-Arts tradition continued in Louisville and basically reached its conclusion with the U.S. Post Office at 6th and Broadway. By this time, the... Boy, I did something to that photograph. Uh, it's a much longer building than it appears in that photograph. Uh, <clears throat> the Beaux-Arts had basically been reduced to a formula at that stage. Uh, very correct. And that's what the federal government built for many, many years. In fact, algorithms I'm just learning about, but with the PowerPoint program now, it will do a caption for you, whether you want it or not. And anything with a column on it, it says is a government building, no matter what it is. <laughs> so that is ingrained both in our minds to see government and also in the algorithms. Uh, a year after this building was built, the Bauhaus was closed in Berlin and its artists and architects spread to the winds. Many of them landed in Louisville and they became the exemplars of the international style which spelled the end of the Beaux-Arts movement. Uh, William Dodd did not live to see the last of these events. He died in his third adopted city, New Orleans in 1930. He had moved in 1913 and continued to practice law until his death. 
While in Louisville, he left an indelible mark on his temporarily adopted home and achieved lasting fame as, in Sam Thomas's words, quote, Louisville's preeminent architect of the last century, close quote. Much of the fame relies on the buildings he designed in the Beaux-Arts style, and one of the best is our home, the Ferguson Mansion. Thank you all very much. <laughs>